right into our lesson this morning. A prayer request, please. Let's be praying for Nicole uh, Tilma Chu. Uh, she is in hospital this morning at uh, Vancouver General. She's got low blood platelets, and it just kind of came on like a, an attack yesterday afternoon. Had to rush her to the emergency room. And uh, so the Fred and Epi are helping with the grandbaby. I see Michelle's here this morning, but they've had early mornings uh, in the hospital up till one, two in the morning. And she'll be in the hospital for a couple of days at least. So please jot a uh, note down on your bulletin to be praying for Nicole uh, as she's in hospital uh, right now. And we'll try to keep you updated on that. Uh, let's see, a couple things, again, announcements. I'll make these in the morning service as well. We were just able to, to schedule a guest preacher for tonight. He's in the area out at Harvest Baptist Church preaching for Pastor Getty and the people there, and they don't have an evening service. Uh, evangelist Tom Farrell is his name. Uh, he's been in evangelism since the 70s. Uh, his um, his uh, son, Ben, married one of uh, Patch the Pirate's daughters. Uh, but anyway, he's been uh, preaching. I've never met him personally. I've read his book on preaching. A great a book on preaching that's come out recently, but he'll be with us tonight, and he flies out uh, at 11 o'clock this evening, so we're looking forward to having him. I trust that you can make plans to be here for the 6 o'clock meeting tonight, and again, we're looking forward to having him. This is Vacation Bible School Week, and every night, starting tomorrow night, 6.30, we have Vacation Bible School here in this building from 6.30 to 9. We will be trying to do pre-registration Today, if you have children that are in Vacation Bible School, we would like to register them after the 11 o'clock service. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll have something set up for that. Brother Raybert asked me to announce that. So if you have young people that are going to be attending Bible School, we want to register them today, if at all possible. All right. One other announcement. I don't have the book. Oh, I have one here. Um, next Sunday... Uh, I don't see any of my ushers at the moment, but next Sunday, Charles, maybe you can help me with this. Next Sunday, we're starting this new series on fruit by the bushel. If you did not get the student book and you would like a student book, this is next Sunday. We'll be starting this. Just raise your hand and we can bring one to you. I know I was handing them out earlier. Anyone else not get one of these that would like one starting next Sunday in the Sunday school? Okay, we can get you one if you need it. We, if, you're, if you're able to put in $3 to help cover the cost of that, that would be great. I don't have to have it. To, we don't have to have it today, but just sometime uh, in the near future, that would be great. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn with me, please, to the book of Romans, chapter number 12. This is lesson number 13 in our series that we've been, uh, that we've been working on, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful series. I know to me personally it has been... Uh, an, an enjoyable series. It's been a challenging one, uh, and um, just to see what more we can do for God. And the series title has been Living Beyond Your Capacity, and so this is the last lesson, and so I trust this morning that once again you'll give attention to the Word of God, and let me just encourage you to be faithful in the Sunday school hour, 10 o'clock every Sunday, uh, we, we go through these lessons. We have a class for the young people, the, the really, really young people, um, the junior age and the teenagers, and then us here in the adult class. And uh, I just want to encourage you to be a part of the 10 o'clock Sunday school. It's not a waste of time by any stretch of the imagination. It's not just added on for the sake of adding it on. It's not preaching, although sometimes preaching develops out of it. <laughs> okay, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Um, we try to make it teaching, but preaching does evolve out of it, of course, for sure. But uh, it's just different. It's a little different uh, atmosphere as we go through a lesson that's been laid out for us. So uh, I trust that you'll be um, uh, coming and be faithful to the Sunday School Hour. Let's pray and ask God's blessing on our meeting. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the freedom once again to meet here in this facility. Lord, as we consider uh, the, the niceties of this building and Lord, then we consider the places around the world where Christians have already met today in many places. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we have this place and Lord, may we not take it for granted. Lord, we, we want to we lift up Nicole this morning and the family there and Lord, that you would help the doctors to be able to 
uh, meet the needs there and help them. We pray that you would give comfort and just uh, healing to, to her body. And uh, Lord, we, we know that you're her, she is in your hands, and we just uh, want to pray for her this morning as her uh, church family here, that she was here for some time, and then her family is still with us, and we thank you for Fred and Epi and Michelle, and we pray that you'd strengthen them as they've had a long night, and uh, just bless the family, Lord. And again, we thank you for this meeting that we can have here as we open up your word. Teach us from your word today, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 12 is not an unfamiliar passage of scripture to many of us, I'm sure. Verses 1 and 2 are ones that we'll be reading by way of introduction. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This lesson this morning is obviously somewhat of a summary of everything that we have been teaching up until this point. The title of the lesson, if you have the curriculum in front of you, is The Spirit-Filled Life. The Spirit-Filled Life. And we're going to look at three disciplines, three disciplines this morning as it applies to the Spirit-Filled Life. The Spirit-Filled Life. Allowing the Spirit of God to have complete control of our lives. When you were saved, we know one thing happened. Many things happened, but we know one thing. One thing that happened when you became a Christian, if you are a born-again Christian today, immediately the Holy Spirit of God took up residence in your life and in my life. No questions asked. You have, and we've said this before and we'll say it again, um, you have all of the Holy Spirit that anyone can get. You cannot get more of the Holy Spirit by becoming more spiritual. You were given all of the Holy Spirit the moment you got saved, the moment I got saved. But the difference in, in our lives many times is how much of us does the Holy Spirit have? And that's the problem in my life. That's why I sin, because I don't walk in the Spirit all the time. I still have a body of flesh. You still have a body of flesh. And we have the opportunity every day, though, to get up. Just like we get up and do everything that we do, we need to every day and even moments, many moments during the day, we need to, again, yield control of our lives to the Holy Spirit of God. Let me read you something that D.L. Moody said, and I think it's worth reading this morning. When D.L. Moody was just starting in the ministry, he heard a preacher make this statement. The world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully surrendered to him. Moody that night said this, by God's grace, I'll be that man. We know from church history that D.L. Moody it said that he basically shook two continents with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's been recorded that well over one million souls came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior because of the influence of D.L. Moody. Why do you think that is the case? I believe that is the case because of what he said. I want to be a man that is fully surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the Holy Spirit deserves that control of our lives. The Holy Spirit deserves that control of my life. If you have your Bible open, you notice in verse number um, uh, one of what we just read, uh, Paul says it is only reasonable. I think that's an interesting way to put it. It's only reasonable that I would allow the Holy Spirit to control my life. In other words, it's not too much to ask. It's basic Christianity, if you will, that I would allow the Holy Spirit of God to control me. Now, um, I, I read this actually this week that um, um, we take the gospel to people so that they can be what? Born again. So they can be saved. Um, we do not have the power to clean up someone's life, do we? We don't have that power. But we know the power is available through the Holy Spirit of God. For instance, when I got saved at the age of nine, not everything in my life immediately was corrected. And in fact, 31 years later, not everything is still corrected. When you got saved, maybe you got saved as a teenager or maybe you got saved as an adult. And when you got saved, there were things in your life that were not godly. 
Not everything in your life that was ungodly was immediately dealt with the day you got saved. Yes, you were given the Holy Spirit of God, but not everything in your life was immediately uh, taken care of, if you will. Not everything changed the moment that you got saved in a sense of doing things that are ungodly. However, the Holy Spirit of God has a desire and he wants to take those things in my life that are not godly and he wants to change me. Notice, if you will, in these verses that we read a moment ago, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy. I wonder, you know, what kind of things in my life today are not considered holy? How long would the list be? I'm sure it would be long for all of us. But it is our duty to strive by the grace of God to follow this admonition to live a holy life. Now, the Holy Spirit has the ability, if we allow him, to clean us up from the inside out. He has the ability to take our old ways and get rid of them if we will what? Walk in the Spirit. He wants to lead me into a life full of uh, an abundant Christian life, not a Christian life that's always uh, in living in defeat. Now, we make mistakes. The Bible says that a just man falleth seven times. I've, I've quoted that verse a lot. That is a saved man that falls. You know what that tells me? We don't live a perfect life just because we're born again Christians. I don't, have my, I don't have my new glorified body yet. I'm still carrying around a robe of flesh, and so are you. And so, but, but there, there's an opportunity for us to live that abundant life. If you have your Bible, go with me quickly to John 10.10, 10, please. The Gospel of John, chapter number 10. Verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I wonder this morning, and don't, don't raise your hand, but think about this this morning. How often have we experienced, or how often do you experience the abundant Christian life? The abundant Christian life. I know what we experience a lot. That's the nominal Christian life. The nominal Christian life is very easy. It, it's, it's very much geared to the flesh. Just doing what it takes to get by. Just living in a way that, you know, we, we're not, we don't want to get too much committed to the Lord. We don't want to give up too much for the Lord. And, and, but yet God says, Jesus said, I did not come to give you a nominal Christian life. He said, I came to give you an abundant one. I came to give you one that has joy in the midst of trials. You know, every Christian here this morning, if you're a born-again Christian, you can experience joy in the midst of the deepest, darkest trial of your life. Because joy, because joy or the lack thereof do not come because of trials or because of prosperity. Many people think, well, if I, was only, if I only had more money, I'd be happier. I think everybody here probably knows that's not true. It doesn't take long to figure out that more money does not bring more joy. But I'll tell you what brings more joy, walking in the spirit every day. That brings joy. And we can even have joy when everything around us is crumbling. Because, again, our joy does not come through circumstances. Our joy comes through the Holy Spirit of God. I want to have it more abundantly. Charles Spurgeon said this, the greatest crime of sinners is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. And we talked about that. The unpardonable sin, right? But he said the greatest fault of saints is to neglect the Holy Ghost. The greatest sin of a sinner is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost. The greatest sin of a saint is to neglect the Holy Ghost. Knowing about the Holy Spirit of God is different than experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. It's just like someone says, well, I know who Jesus is. Great, do you know Jesus? A lot of people know who Jesus is. They've read about him. They've heard about him. But they don't know Jesus as their personal Savior. How about it, dear Christians? Let's look at the other side of the coin. We say we're a Christian and we know the Holy Spirit. But do we know the Holy Spirit? Do we know his presence in our life? There's nothing mystical about the Holy Spirit of God. It is, he is a third of the Godhead, if you will. 
And, the, and he is indwelling me this morning, and he's indwelling you as a believer, and he desires to work from the inside out in our life. Knowing about the Holy Spirit is quite different from experiencing him at work in your life. So let's, let's take a look at three commands from the Bible. We must move along. Turn in your Bibles now, please, to Ephesians chapter 5. Some of these verses you have memorized, and, 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 and we know about them. And I guess this morning what I would uh, reiterate as we look through these three areas um, with uh, the idea of the spirit-filled life, that we would not only have these verses memorized, that, but, but that we would do the best we can and ask the Lord Jesus to help us to not only know them and memorize them, but to apply them daily in our life. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18 is a very familiar verse to, to I, I think, many of us this morning. The Apostle Paul says, And be not drunk with wine, where is an excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The key there is filled with the Spirit. Number one in our outline is be filled with the Spirit. Now, I want you to think about this, and this is not new, maybe maybe it's somewhat new to some, but it's not new maybe to you this morning. The only way I can be filled with something is to empty myself of something first, right? You know, if I had a cup of water up here filled to the top, and I said, okay, uh, Ada, would you go put some coffee in this cup for me? Can she put coffee in a cup of water that's filled to the top without emptying some water first? No, she can't. She's got to dump the water out first and then put some coffee in there. You know, we want to be filled with the Spirit, but unfortunately many of our lives were filled with the flesh. How can we be filled with the Spirit and filled with the flesh at the same time? Let me answer that for you. You can't. The Holy Spirit of God is not going to use a vessel that is filled with the world that is filled with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, if I'm filled with the world, forget about being filled with the Spirit. Yeah. They say, I thought you said we were already filled with the Spirit. No, being filled with the Spirit is being controlled by the Spirit. Yes, you are a possessor of the Spirit of God as a born-again believer. We have been given the Spirit of God when we got saved. That is our down payment. That is our earnest, if you will. We've been sealed by the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us these things. But just because I am possessed by the Spirit of God doesn't mean I'm allowing him to control me. What are we allowing to control us today? That is a question that you can ask. And by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ knows, God knows exactly my heart and your heart today. And again, I would encourage you to consider what is it that is filling you right now? Galatians 2.20, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Talking about being dead to the self, dead, dying to self. Obviously, Christ was crucified, and Paul is saying, I need to be crucified with him. Does that mean I need to be nailed to a cross? No, it means I need to die to Paul every day. Have we died to ourself lately? And then in Romans chapter 6, verse number 12, we read, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness. You see, here's the thing. We are yielding to one way or the other. It's like we come to that fork in the road or we come to that, that T in the road where we must turn right or we must turn left. And turning right is being filled with the spirit. Turning left is being filled with the flesh. We have to make a choice. Every day this is how we live. Either controlled by the spirit or controlled by me and then you. And we must make the right choice. He says there in verse number 13, do not yield yourselves unto, uh, as unto righteousness, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So I'm either serving the flesh or I'm being controlled by the Spirit every day. Now, I would have to admit this morning that most of us here, we don't get up and say, now today I'm going to live in the flesh. What a day it's going to be. Do you do that? I don't do that. I don't think anybody gets up and says this, that I'm dedicating myself to the flesh today. I don't think Christians do that. In other words, we do not willfully choose to walk in the flesh. So how, come, how, how is it that we end up walking in the flesh? It happens by default. Because if we don't make a choice to walk in the spirit, again, there's only one other option. Then we will walk in the flesh. We don't get up in the morning and say, this is going to be a day of sin and evil in my life. 
I'm going to displease God today. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. No, but what we don't do is we don't get up in the morning and say, Dear Heavenly Father, I need to die to Ben Turner right now. These hands are not mine. These eyes are not mine. These ears are not mine. These feet are not mine. I yield complete control of my life to you today. Why? Because I don't know what's going to happen that day. But God does. I don't know what's going to come across, and I'm going to have a, as we say, I'm going to have a knee-jerk reaction. You know what? I don't need any knee-jerk reactions because a knee-jerk reaction usually means a fleshly reaction. I need a spirit-controlled reaction. But I don't know what's going to happen at 12.30 this afternoon. I don't know what's going to happen at 5 o'clock tonight or 9 o'clock tonight. I don't know what telephone call is going to come in. I don't know what challenge is going to come across my path. But I have one inside of me that can help me through that. And if I do not yield myself to him, I guarantee you, by default, I will follow the flesh. And I think you would probably do the same thing. So, letter A, I think we've covered it. It's a matter of choice. It's a matter of choice. It is a daily decision. It could be a hourly decision. Have you made that choice today? Yes, on Sunday, we need to be spirit-filled. Amen? We need to be spirit-filled on Sunday. The preaching of the word of God, the teaching of the word of God. Uh, somebody may sit in our seat. <laughs> Not spirit-filled. You get bit out of shape. If you get bit out of shape with some, oh, oh, the pastor, he didn't call us about the 845 service. Maybe you didn't have your number. Uh, anyway, uh, but you know what? The, the, the person that's, uh, and I, I'm being funny here, a little bit funny, but I'm a little bit serious. But the person that says, um, uh, man, what's that all about? That's somebody who's controlled by the flesh. But the person who says, well, oh, well, hey, at least I get to go to church today. You know, I don't, I don't have the, I don't, we don't have the fear of armed guards coming in here today. Like some people do in some places around this world. Oh, okay, I came a little bit early. It's okay. Or, you know, somebody, so, hey, you need to be spirit-filled coming to church, too. Why? Because there's a lot of saints that come to church. Pastor's a big one. So, you got, if we're going to be together as sinners on Sunday, uh, we better be spirit-filled sinners. Because somebody may say something that offends us, and then, you know what, we don't have to be offended. Why? Because we're being controlled by the Spirit. Well, I didn't like that special you sang today. You were flat on all those notes. Well, that's okay. Be Spirit-controlled. They, they haven't picked my song in six months that I like from the hymn book. You see why we need to be Spirit-filled when we go to church? Yeah. By the way, you think these things are trivial, but th these things happen. I don't know that they've happened here a whole lot, and I hope they never do, but these things happen, and maybe you just never voiced it, and it happened in your, in your heart. By the way, that's not spirit-controlled, my friend. And I, as a pastor, I, I want to be spirit-filled for, for various reasons, obviously, presenting the Word of God, but then there's many other reasons. When we come to church, we need to be spirit-filled. It's a choice that we make. Not only is it a choice, but it's a decision of faith. Letter B. It's a decision of faith. The filling of the Spirit is not a feeling. You know, well, I really feel like I'm filled today. It's not a feeling, my friend. I'll tell you a lot of things that will bring feelings, and one of them is not being filled with the Holy Spirit of God, not being Spirit-controlled. It's not a feeling. It's a matter of faith. Luke 11, verse 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your Father, how much more shall your heavenly Father... Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of faith. I, I, I highlighted this. The Holy Spirit wants to do the following. He wants to guide my steps. He wants to filter my thinking. He wants to direct my words. He wants to order my life. How much am I letting the Holy Spirit of God do these things? It's a decision of faith. Letter C, it is a repeated process. It is a repeated process. Again, we've mentioned that a moment ago, that it's not, it's not even sometimes once a day, because remember a few weeks ago we talked about the things that we can do against the Holy Spirit? We can quench the Holy Spirit. So there could be, you know, you came in this morning and, you know, somebody was sitting in your seat. I don't know why I'm using that one so much today. And so, you know, I mean, you were just pumped and ready to be in church, and then, what? I can't believe that. Doesn't he or she know that's my chair? What's that doing? That's funny, I know, but it happens anyway. Um, 
What's that doing to the Holy Spirit? That's pouring water. You know what? When I pray in a moment for Sunday school to end, you might have to say, Holy Spirit, I'm sorry. And maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was something else. Maybe maybe your husband wasn't ready on time today, ladies. That was funny. Anyway, sorry. I guess it wasn't funny. Uh, maybe somebody wasn't re- Maybe somebody, you know, I don't know. Somebody cut you off on the way to church. How dare they cut me off? Do you think that's spirit-filled life? Not the driving. I'm talking about your reaction. We can quench the Holy Spirit of God. So, you know what? Many times I have to say, you know what, Holy Spirit, I, God, I am sorry that I, because I don't want anything to come in, in, in front of his control of my life. It is a repeated process. The psalmist, it took him a year, but he finally said, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Psalm 51.10. And renew a right spirit within me. I wonder if we need to pray that prayer today. Living a, living a spirit-filled life requires a quick response to sin. Again, David, one year. What are you carrying around with you today that you need to get right with God? The spirit-filled life says, I don't want to carry around this bitterness. I, I, have, I find possibly bitterness is a very, it's a very um, prevalent one, even in a church like this. Because bitterness can be concealed for a long time. You know, there's some sins that can't be concealed, right? I mean, if you see me walking out of the pub tomorrow, that's a problem, right? That's, that can't be concealed. You, you see that, right? Um, but bitterness is one that I can hold or you can hold in your life, in my life, for a long time. Some longer than others. I'll tell you this, though. Eventually, it will be seen. And usually, it will be seen like a massive explosion going on. Can I encourage you something today? And I don't know. Maybe, maybe, there's, maybe there's a few people today that there's something that you are bitter about. <coughs> by the way, you're not going to be controlled by the Spirit of God if you're harboring bitterness. Right. You can't. Because the Bible says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and evil speaking be put away from you. Maybe today is the day you need to leave the bitterness right here. And if you don't, it's only going to fester and fester and fester and be out of control. And bitterness never remains in the effect of just you or me. It's a cancer. It will spread to your family, to your church family, to everyone around you. F.B. Meyer said this, do not pray for more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity and is not in pieces. That's a good point, isn't it? Every child of God has all of him, but does he have all of us? Missionary Betty Scott Stam, she was a missionary to China, martyred, by, martyred with her husband. She lived from 1906 to 1934 murdered at the age of 28. She said, Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes, and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all utterly to thee, to be thine forever. Fill me and seal me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt. Send me where thou wilt. Work out thy whole will in my life at any cost. Now, and forever. She only lived 28 years. But I think she got it right. Even 28 years, if it's given to the Lord, it's far better than 70 years of misery. We don't have to live a miserable 70 years, though, by the way. We can have this type of attitude now. So, filled with the Spirit, number two, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Letter A, 
It is a developed habit. A developed habit. The word walk implies, from Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The word walk there implies to march in step with, to fall into rank, to conform to the virtue of. And so when we think of the word walk, it's often used to reference my daily what? Lifestyle. How is your walk with God? We're talking about how is your devotional life or how are you how are how have you been praying or reading your Bible or you know how is your how is your daily walk? Talking about, you know, how how are we in our Christian experience if you will. Galatians 5:25, if we live in the spirit, okay? That's being controlled by the spirit. Let us also walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit. Walking in the spirit boils down to my everyday choices. We've talked about it's a choice to be filled with the spirit, but walking in the spirit uh, is a daily decision. Do I choose to yield control to him? So letter A, it's a developed habit. Letter B, it's a dangerous neglect. It's dangerous to neglect the Holy Spirit. Jeremiah 2, 32. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me. My people have forgotten me. Days without number. Here's a very personal question. How many days have, we, have passed since we chose to walk in the Spirit. Remember what the default is? Walking in the flesh. So you say, well, I didn't choose to walk in the flesh. We chose to walk in the flesh when we neglected to walk in the Spirit. There's no third option. You know, it's kind of like, where are you going when you die? There's only two options. The Bible says there's only two options. Amen? <laughs> There is no purgatory. Sorry if that bothers you, but it's not in the Bible. You can't find it. You can look. Look very hard. It's not there. When you die, you're either going to heaven or hell. That's it. Thank God I'm going to heaven. Not because I'm a good man, but because Jesus Christ died for me and I've trusted him as my Savior. I wonder if you've done that today. If you haven't, well, today would be a great day. Same, on the same token, I have two choices. Walk in the Spirit or walk in the flesh. It's a daily choice. It's a dangerous thing to neglect. We either choose to hear and obey the spirit or we choose the carnal life. Here's a thought. A messed up life, usually, usually, let's say this before we see this. A messed up life is usually just a whole bunch of bad decisions put together. Usually. Usually it's not one major bad decision. Sometimes it is, okay? Let's not say every time about anything. <laughs> but that's what it usually is, and they just mount and mount and mount and mount and mount. However, this is encouraging. A blessed life is the exact opposite, obviously. It is a whole bunch of good decisions put together. For instance, I'm going to read my Bible this morning. That's a good decision, isn't it? It is a good decision. Okay, good. I'm glad you think it's a good decision to read our Bible. Uh, then when I get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to make another good decision. And what is that? I'm going to read my Bible again. That's a good decision. It's very easy to say, well, I'm going to read my Bible every day this year, but if you don't get up every morning and make that decision, you're not going to do it. Okay, you make one big decision. I'm going to read my Bible every day. It's January 1st. Here's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to read my Bible every day for the next 365 or 366 days, depending on the week you're in. But you know what? January 2nd rolls around. i got another decision to make. What is it? Read my Bible. January 3rd, you got a decision to make. What is it? Read my Bible. It's not one big decision. It's 365 days I get up and say, I'm reading my Bible today. 
And what would happen, what, by the way, what happens when a Christian gives his life to reading his or her Bible every day? I didn't say read the Bible through every year. If that's something God impresses on you to do, do it. But, hey, every day getting in the word of God. What's that going to do to you? What's that going to do to me? Boy, it's going to clean us up. It's going to encourage us. It's going to challenge us. But it's what? It's every day making a decision. Okay, let's think about it the other way. January 1st, I make a decision to read the word of God every day this year. That's a great, big, monster decision. January 2nd, my alarm clock doesn't go off on time. I'm rushing around. I barely even get to have a cup of coffee. I run out the door. I head to work. I'm already just flabbergasted. You know, I get every red light. It's still January 2nd. I have a meeting with my boss. Uh, usually I'm off on January 2nd, so anyway, but just bear with me. Um, I have a meeting with my boss that morning, and he levels me with a project that he says, this has to be done in a week, and it's like three weeks away. Like, we're going to be ripping on this. I get home, and, you know, the dog is sick. And, you know, the fish drowned. <laughs> Think about that. I'm just ready to go to bed when it's time to go to bed. I don't want to read my Bible, so I go to bed. Bad decision. Right. What about, what, wait a minute, I said on January 1st, I was going to make a really big deal. I was going to read my Bible all the way through. Yeah, but you got to decide that every day. Right. It's like saying, you know what, I'm going to be filled with the Spirit for the rest of my life. Well, that's great. But I, you know what I think is better? I want to be filled with the Spirit today. Good. In fact, I want to be filled with the Spirit right now. Because it's a lot of decisions adding up that bring us to uh, a place of God using us in a mighty way. So the choice is ours. Be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Thirdly, we must Zoom. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. <coughs> First Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. A natural outflow of walking with the Spirit will be prayer. Praying in the Spirit. Letter A, this is a spiritual weapon. A spiritual weapon. This is the greatest exercise that I can do with the help of the Holy Spirit is pray. By the way, prayer is the vital part of, vic of, 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 um, of being victorious in spiritual warfare. Obviously, Bible, the Bible is our weapon, yes. But think about this in Jude chapter 20. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. The book of Jude is written to Christians who are, if you will, under fire. Remember that other verse? Jude earnestly contend for the faith. That means there seems to be there's a battle going on there of contention, if you will. And toward the end of the book, we read this command to build up ourselves. How? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Most of us are familiar with Ephesians 6, 18, and 19. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly. How do we open our mouths boldly? Time of prayer. Time of prayer. Praying in the Holy Spirit. This quote. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more, and novel methods, but men and women whom the Holy Spirit can use. Men of prayer, mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods. The Holy Spirit flows through people. He does not come on machinery but on people. He does not anoint plans, but he anoints those that are men and women of prayer. Spiritual weapon, letter B, it's a continual conversation. I 
I heard it said years ago, it's good to have a prayer time, but it's better to have a prayer life. When I heard that for the first time, I didn't really, didn't really sink in, but eventually it did. It takes a while sometimes. I have a very thick head. But that's so true. I was so concerned that I have a prayer time, and, and I believe we should have a prayer time. But you know what? Think about a prayer life. The difference is this. I get up in the morning, and I have that Bible reading, and I, and I pray, and I don't pray again for 24 hours. You think that's what God wants? Well, I had my prayer time already. It's done. I checked it off. I'll, I'll do it again tomorrow morning at the same time, same channel, same place. No. We have the opportunity because God says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, let us come boldly. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. What does it say? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God doesn't just answer prayer and listen to prayer at 7 a.m. at your bedside or my bedside or whatever time. It's in time of need. That means at 1030, I can go to God in prayer. That means at 1 p.m., I can go to God in prayer, and I ought to. That means at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock. That means every 30 minutes if necessary. And I believe God is so waiting to hear from so many Christians that he hears from once a day, once a week, once a month, maybe at dinner and maybe at lunch. And he's saying, you know what? I want to hear from you. I'm, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm ready to listen. If you'll call, I'm ready to listen. If you'll call, I'm ready to answer. In fact, I'm just ready to show you some of the things like Jeremiah wrote about. You won't even believe it. They're great and mighty things, which thou knowest not. But Jeremiah said the first thing is call. Call. How are we calling? How much are we calling? He is with me every moment. He is with us every day. He desires to hear from you. He desires to hear from me. I want you to think just a moment. These three thoughts, and then we're going to close with an illustration. Being filled with the Spirit. It's a choice. Walking in the Spirit. It's a choice. Praying in the Spirit. That's also a choice. These are all choices that we make every day. I don't have one with me today, but in my office I have a boxing glove. A real official boxing glove. How many of you have ever uh, put on a real boxing glove? They're pretty nice. I got this boxing glove at a youth conference a few years ago, and it's all signed by the preachers that were at that youth conference. The theme had to do about spiritual warfare and, 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 uh, and fighting the Christian life. That boxing glove has been sitting on my shelf for several years. Now, it's been taken off a few times. People have come in and, and looked at it and things like that. I remember we had the, the red boxing gloves. Now, these were the, you know, uh, Toys R Us specials when I was a kid, right? But my brothers and I had boxing gloves, but they weren't real. They weren't real as padded. And uh, maybe my brothers can attest to that more than me, but I think I attested to a few times too. But it's sitting on the shelf. That boxing glove sitting on the shelf is not going to win any heavyweight championship boxing belts or featherweight. I just figured I'd start with mine, which is heavyweight. It's not going to win any fights. It's a beautiful boxing glove. I mean, it's a real one, even. But it's not going to do anything sitting on the shelf. I'd like to think that you and I are like a boxing glove this morning. We're either sitting on the shelf, looking really good, really saved. We got everything in order, but we're not winning anything, any spiritual battle sitting on the shelf. You see, the difference is the Holy Spirit would be the hand, if you will. The Holy Spirit would, would be the hand that goes inside of that boxing glove. And now I'm filled with the Spirit of God. The hand would be the Spirit of God with me. He needs my glove. Yes, he does. 
The whole, the God, God has not sent angels down to do his business, if you will, his work. He wants you, me. He wants you. He, he, he will use us if we'll just allow him to come and take us off the shelf. It's a choice that we make. And I want to be, I want God's spirit to be inside my glove, my life. So that I can go to battle for him. You know what? When you, when you go to battle for the Lord, it hurts sometimes. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be a bed of roses to serve God. Can you imagine the, I know boxes up don't have healing, but just imagine they did. I mean, you should see the other, the other gloves. I mean, all that hitting. But at the end of the, of the fight, battered and torn. 28 years old, this lady was as a missionary to China. That's all, that's all God needed her for, 28 years. He took her home. But she was in the hand of the Holy Spirit of God. David Brainerd didn't live very long, but we still talk about him today. I think he was in his 20s as well, wasn't he? Why are we still talking about him? Because he wasn't on the shelf. He said, Holy Spirit of God, here's my glove, or here's a glove, here's my life, fill it and use me. And we're still talking about David Brainerd. How many years later? A long time. There was probably a lot of other Christians around David Brainerd's time just like there are a lot of Christians in our time today. And not that we want a desire to be talked about someday, but the bottom line is this. I, I look at that glove all, all, every day that I'm in my office. I look at that glove and I think, you know what? God wants to use my life for his glory. And I think God wants to use everybody's life and anchor back to the church where he can. But we're going to have to allow him to fill us. Or what are we going to be? Just another boxing glove. I don't want to be just another Christian. I want to be filled with the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for these lessons. I hope that we don't just take our book of notes and put it up on the bookshelf and get ready for the next one. But that we honestly evaluate. Are we letting you fill our life, our boxing glove? to go to the next, to, to, the, to, be a, to be a soldier, to be a fighter for your glory. Bless now the meeting to follow in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.